Hello, this is TFN Sue with the Far Away Nearby podcast. I am here with DJ Star Sage. Hello. And, and our guest, Nerdy Pam. Greetings. And, and we are going to ask Pam to give us a short bio of herself. Um, I am a cetacean rights activist helping to end things like whale and dolphin captivity. I've been a nerd since I can remember. <laughs> so it's, it's it's Game of Thrones night, and I go all the way back to watching, not the original, 10 years later when it was in reruns, the first sci-fi show I remember seeing was like Lost in Space, and then I found so Actually, my current obsession thing, waiting for it to come back, is a show called Killjoy is on the sci-fi. By channel and, and I am a practicing massage therapist in the state of Maryland. The Pam is actually an amalgam of things that I'm kind of into, which would be like uh, politics, animals, and then you know, and so forth. Uh, other than that, it's work home, work home. Hopefully, yeah. I will be going. <laughs> I can relate. Okay, well, so my week was interesting. This At the candy shop this past week, I filled in for a co-worker who was going out on vacation. And the uh, poor man, he and his wife have only been married probably three years, and this is the first time they've been able to get away. And uh, he's not been at this job probably a little more than mm, nine months or so. Mm-hmm. Um but we are performing a new function in my department. We basically are running these conference calls that are essentially sales orders, but um, the uh, customers are actually paying extra for these special conference calls. They call it coordination. So um, we actually have a report that we pull for this list of accounts that comes across for the states that we do our business in or do business in, <laughs> and uh, basically our boss picks who from the team is going to be assigned to that particular conference call. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit of a stressful task just because, you know, in any situation, the the management team doesn't always know the details of the job. So it's the responsibility of this person to kind of be the liaison and say, well, you know, this is – when this order is supposed to be due and this is the time the call is supposed to be. So I spent the better part of last week learning how to do that job <laughs> just to be able to fill in for that role this week. And mm-hmm. I'm, uh, I'm happy to say that I managed to survive the stress and I have a new appreciation for what my coworker does because it seemed like every time I turned around, my boss was coming to me all frazzled, wondering what was going on with a certain account, and I'd have to break the news to her and explain, there's nothing to worry about. This isn't due for another week. <laughs> <laughs> but, of course, that doesn't stop the, cu- the client from calling in and yeah. freaking out. So I-, I have to, you know, tell her to stop, take a moment and breathe, get all the details before you dive into the deep end. That was the first part of my week. I think that that was kind of a a high point because I sort of felt important and feeling important is a good thing in your job because it uh, assures you that you get to keep it. And uh, the other part of my week had to do with some family drama. I've mentioned before my two sisters, Betty and Veronica, Recently, there's been a turn of events where our stepdad, who I shall refer to as Mr. Mooney, <laughs> because, uh, well, he's a retired yeah. accountant and he's comfortable. Yes. Anyways, we've been without mom for a few years now, and this poor sweet man has a lot of love to give, and he's been all by himself. And mm-hmm. we've recently learned that a new person has come into his life. So, of course, he's looking at getting remarried. Right. And, well, Betty is a little bit more emotional than Veronica or myself. And she was a little bit offended when she learned that mother's engagement ring, which, mind you, was not our father's gift to her, but our stepfather's gift to her. Right. That he was going to 
sell it to pay for his new engagement ring to his new wife, which, since this man is not my father, I felt it was none of my business. This was his gift to my mother, and he happened to survive her. So it was his right. choice of what he was going to do. But the backstory is that when Mom and Mr. Mooney were dating and he proposed, he asked her permission to incorporate her ring that she already had since uh, her first husband, my dad, is no longer with us for quite some long time now. Right. And so he took that ring with her blessing and turned it into a new ring. And that's really what oh. the argument is. is that I, would, I would be upset about that too. And, and I understand that, and I don't mean to sound chauvinist with this, possibly only because I'm the youngest and I lived away from the family. I yeah. didn't feel offended by the idea that Mr. Mooney would be basically trading in the ring but in my mind's eye, you know, mother's no longer with us, and this wasn't my father's gift. So it's in my, you know, in my uh, perspective, it's is it's it's his ring, it's his property. But, but yeah, but it sounds like if if he included your the engagement ring your father gave to your mother, it would that would. Um, that would be that would be something that wasn't that wasn't Mr. Mooney's. It would be something that was your father's. But it was melted down. Well, I mean, yes, it was melted down, and the and the and the diamonds or whatever were included. It were put into the uh, new setting. New setting. Yes, it's. Uh, I I I understand that, and and that um, that would. Um, but I, I, I mean that that would be it, it's, it's sort of like you lost the engagement ring your father gave your mother. Now maybe, uh, maybe no one cares about that except your sister Betty. Mm -hmm. And I would gather there's too many uh, grandchildren in the family. Grand uh, that that. N there wouldn't be one special child that that w ring would have gone to. Right. There aren't any close granddaughters. You know, well, from that, it, it, it turned into another element of drama because my eldest sister, Ronnie, Veronica, she, um, she thought that she would try to settle the drama because uh, she felt that Betty was upset by this. Although, in, in uh, reality, I feel that that Betty was more upset about Mr. Mooney getting remarried. Oh. And um, I, I, I get the feeling that she wasn't really upset about the ring so much as she was about Mr. Mooney getting remarried, but in reality, our mother was a widow for five years, and he's been a widower for three and a half. He's never been alone this long, and he's in yeah. his 80s. I, I think it's really hard for people to. I don't know it, if you're going to be upset about his getting remarried, then you should have been upset about your mother getting remarried. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it seems to me that there were some kind of hard feelings, and there were some difficulties in getting used to Mr. Mooney when he first came into the family. Mm -hmm. But obviously everybody did. You described him as a sweet man, and that's better than you described him when you first, when he first started dating your mother. So. <laughs> yes, he he grew on me. I've I've grown to uh, have respect for him because my father was m very much a homebody, and uh -huh. and part of that was because he had a limited education. He dropped out of high school, and he had a learning disability. So. Traveling didn't bode well with him because it, mm -hmm. it uh, brought out the ignorance factor. Yeah. You know, I eventually gained respect for Mr. Mooney because I learned that in the eight years that he and Mom were married, he literally showed her the world. They traveled to the Caribbean, to Alaska, to Middle East, and to England. These are oh. the things that my mother would never have been able to have done with my father. Yeah, and so that sounds really good, and mm -hmm. and obviously he. So I don't know. I, I like I say, I would have been a little offended because of the com combining of the rings. Yeah, and and Betty and, seemed. And, and I would have wanted to have pulled that out for somebody. 
Right. But there again, if there's more than one granddaughter and there's more than one grandson, it's kind of hard to, you know, start dividing up engagement rings from mom and grandma and, you know, if there are such things. Right. And I'll, I'll um, finish up this part by saying this. Like I said, uh, I think that it uh, was a cross between whether Betty was upset with Mr. Mooney for moving on versus <laughs> her not having uh, the ring in the family anymore. Ronnie decided that she wanted to keep the ring in the family to keep Betty happy. Yeah. And who did she come to but me? Because Ronnie and I are the members of the family who are most financially responsible. Right, and so he wanted you to chip in on paying for it. Right, and of course, Billy and I have had our share of expenses recently. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but as much as I love my sister, I have never spent as much as Ronnie was asking me to chip in <laughs> on this gift on somebody that, pardon my French, I wasn't sleeping with. Yes, I, <laughs> so, I could understand that. So that brings us to Pam. We would like to hear about the highs and low points of your last week or two. Actually, I, I have two dogs, and I apologize for the explosion. The pizza guy came, and when you have a German Shepherd, the whole world is after you. <laughs> um, it, it's true, and and. If there's a pizza, the German Shepherd thinks it's his or hers. Well, he also, he, more importantly, he thinks the pe- the person delivering the pizza needs to be killed. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, we tend to go hiking. My best friend who is here now and I, we go out, go hiking sometimes. The highlight of the week was I had a cart delivered that the German Shepherd is going to learn to pull. So that uh, when the small dog gets tired, we have somewhere to put the small dog so we can keep going. Oh, well, that sounds good. Is the cart also going to be able to carry some stuff so that you don't have to strap everything on your backs? Or is that too much? Yeah, well, it's not that intense level of of high speed. It's not not intended for that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, Well, that's good if she'll be able to learn that easily. That will make hiking much easier for everyone involved, I would think. The biggest fear that the person who made the cart said I should have is people wanting to take dog pulling the other dog in the cart. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The, it, yes. You will become you will become a a um, an object of, of fascination and pictures, I'm sure, and possibly selfies. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> And that, and the low point was. The, I see, low point was trying to get my act together signing in here at this point. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes technology can be very challenging for all of us and uh, very frustrating. Well, uh, guys, my week. I think the high point was that my arm stopped hurting finally. Awesome. And maybe will not hurt again for months or weeks or maybe a day or two. I don't know. <laughs> that was a good thing. And uh, so that, I think, was the high point. And the low point of my week is that my grandchildren, who were supposed to be helping me last week, just did not come through with any of the stuff they were helping me with. And that is very frustrating. Because I have a tendency to want to call them bad names, and that's not very nice. (laughs) Because I love them dearly, and I just don't want to do that. But it is very frustrating when they say, oh, yes, we'll help you with this and this and this. And then you keep getting these things. Well, I can't do that because I got to do this other thing. And I know they're not working, and I know they're not in school, so I'm not sure what this other thing is. But anyway, we will forgive them. I see. So they're they're being typical young 20-somethings, basically. Probably. And they also, I think, are are being somewhat influenced by their mother, who has Mm -hmm. promised their help to me. Because I have physical problems, and yet whenever I need that help, it doesn't seem to be there. And it's not just their help, but also her husband's and her 
herself or right. but like I say when I need that help it's not there it's somewhere down the road and it's like well I'm a human being and when I need help I need help at this time so, now, you don't have similar young persons on the Duke side of the family, do you? Nope. Okay. But we have we have some young people on. One of his brothers has a boy and a girl who are both adults and have children. But that side of the those children, those children and grandchildren on that side of the family, or, or well, I guess their nieces and nephews, to us, are just not. Um, would the proper term be aloof? They, 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 are, they wouldn't be helping anybody. I see. So they're not really involved with the family? Uh, not very much. Occasionally, the young man uh, gets it together to come over to his grandmother's and mow the lawn. Mm-hmm. But that's pretty much it. Okay. And it probably happens two, maybe three times a summer. So, so Pam, did you have a... An article or topic of some sort that you'd like to talk about? Oh, I, I invest in writing and for for myself, uh, maybe an article and writing it myself on the idiot's guide for how to get into Google Hangouts. Um, <laughs> <laughs> See, well, the funny part is, I'm a Twitter dork. I actually keep a blog. Help people learn to use Twitter effectively. Yes, because I never saw one of those out there that wasn't buried in. You know, and people have strange ideas about Twitter, um, and that's fine. <laughs> uh, but it, I, I am, uh, I, I am in terms of Twitter. I, I will say this: I am what they would probably, what you would probably call a power user. Yeah, I use TweetDeck like, a, you know, I can use. Tweet deck, sleep deck. I would gladly shell out features. I am, but savvy lays. So yeah. Okay. So I will go ahead and discuss my topic. Well, that would be good. And it should be interesting. I like to pick something that's of the strange and unusual. And of course, I've mentioned it in uh, past shows. I like to go to fark f a r k dot com. Mm-hmm. And um, my uh, article I've chosen is something that may be of interest to our guest Pam, knowing her love of animals and her interest in animal rights. My topic I chose is titled Pesky Geese to Become Food for the Homeless. Okay, okay. And so this is an article. I have not heard about that one. This is an article that comes from Washington, D.C. It's WTOP.com, Washington's top news. And this particular article, so this article uh, by Kathy Stewart, says, uh, pesky geese at two parks in Maryland will soon be turned into food for the homeless. After attempts to control their population by non-lethal methods over the years have failed. And the article goes on to mention that 100 to 150 geese will be taken from a couple of different parks in the Silver Spring, Maryland, and Rock Creek Regional Park area in Gaithersburg. And basically, in June and middle of July, they're going to round up these, I guess, what you would call nuisance geese, and they're going to process the meat and donate it to the Maryland Food Bank. So this may be of particular interest because our guest is from the Mid-Atlantic and also an animal rights activist. Uh, What is your take on that, Pam? Well, my situation is I live on the eastern shore. The uh, the Canadian geese here, or the Canada geese, I'm sure that's what they're referring to, had a very, very, very prolific year. And my biggest thing with uh, the animal rights situation animals is fact guys have not been in factory farm except for the fact that they are their own reproductive they uh, we had one we had one set of them here near that produced 17 offspring oh so two geese. Oh, yeah with 17 two geese little goslings 17 offspring them. isn't that a lot 17 yeah but isn't that a That's, lot for one year what i've seen if well, we may have uh, i guess some, like, 
they 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 may have a, they may have adopted if other parents got killed or something like oh, that because these were awesome. around cars. It was the pond. Yeah, it was the pond parking lot. You know. Yeah. They have. It has been a bumper year, so I can understand where that's coming from. These guys are not factory farmed animals. The only animal, the animals that I chose have chosen not to eat or get products from are cows and pigs. Mm-hmm. Birds, when they are slaughtered, it can be done. So there's not a lot of long suffering and so forth and factory farming that goes with them because they're certainly not at in some ways the same some levels now that said i get my eggs from places certified humane i do get cheese from places that i know are not factory farming animals yeah but i really in a way don't have a problem with that but i do love that you brought in wto Team, second home city. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually where I commuted to school. Oh. Would it be up there on Tuesday? No, it's interesting because this article mentions it says excessive feces is one of the problems with the geese. Go figure. And it says yeah. which can produce up to a pound per day per bird. And wow. uh, of course, the article later goes on to say that the Humane Society of the United States has voiced its concern over the plans and would prefer the park system exhausts every non-lethal type of management. Uh, I'm wondering what the alternatives are. I mean, well, um, I don't imagine that there would be too many. The alternatives are that they harvest the animals and then throw them in the dump. Right. and uh, you is, know. is what the alternatives are. Um, I know in... A number of years ago, when they had to harvest like excessive deer and and moose and that, those kind of populations, they would give them to Native Americans in the surrounding areas where they were were at. They would just mm-hmm. you know they would harvest them and they would go go to Native Americans. Uh, I'm guessing that in some areas of the United States. Uh, the homeless in in a given area may include a number of Native Americans uh, because they do have some problem with that as well. But that the the reason that we still allow hunting in the United States, but it is highly regulated, is so that we can keep the wildlife population alive and well and 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 existing and you know, out there for us to go look at, but that it uh, doesn't overpopulate. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in Colorado where I grew up, I've seen years when they did not, uh, when all of the people that they wanted to, or that they had issued licenses to, did not quite get their limit in in deers and antelope and, and moose and the the trees would be well now of course there's a lot of evergreens there and they aren't so likely to eat those but other kinds of trees in the bushes and the grass would be just nibbled down to to almost to where it wasn't going to it was going to take a bit to to uh, resprout in the spring mm-hmm. and um, and then you have starving animals sometimes in the winter and it. it Wildlife uh, people who manage wildlife figure that that is just as bad or perhaps worse than killing the animals and and serving and having it serve as food for for people who would use it. Now, mm-hmm. I'm not so fond of people who go out and hunt and don't use the meat. Right, that's wasteful. So it is, so and so I love venison. You can bring it to me any time. <laughs> so, Sue, did you have something you wanted to lead into? Yes. Um, the what I I've been streaming uh, Orange is the New Black. I started at season one because it's been a while since I've watched it, and they just a week or so. I think it's just been a little over a week. They uh, brought out the the fourth season, and it. It seems to me that the fourth season takes a couple of turns that are kind of odd at the beginning, but and I haven't quite finished it. But I also, as I was watching it this last time, as I was watching the first three seasons, I was wondering, you know, a Piper um, 
and now I forgot the real woman's last name. Um, but the the woman that uh, comes across as Piper Chapman on the in the series by uh, Piper, and I can't remember what her actual last name is. And she wrote a book called Orange is the New Black, explaining the year that she spent in jail for, or in prison for uh, having uh, carried some, moved some uh, drug money from one city to another. And she might have done that twice. I, I'm a little unsure of that. But since I haven't read the book, I'm not entirely certain. But I'm thinking somewhere in the middle of this second season, or maybe even earlier, the stuff that the real woman experienced went away, mm -hmm. and they they started expanding on this because this is this is taking us longer than just a year, mm -hmm. and you know you you would have thought if they were just doing a year, the the first season would have been all they needed to do. Right. But. Uh, we're talking so American I'm wondering now. about that, so I guess I have to sit down and read the book now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, I, I haven't watched it, but I know as much that it was based on a real-life story yes. that was written. And, of course, it was, as you were mentioning, the, you know, the uh, story of a woman who was convicted for a crime. I think mm -hmm. that part of the background, if, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, was that this was a woman who was from, she was a from fairly an mean, upper middle class family. Upper middle class, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I it, can't remember what her dad did, but... It, it, it was, you know, what you would call a respectable, you know, community, possibly. Yeah, she, she'd been to college, she, and she had done this right after she got out of college. Mm -hmm. and she was just goofing around looking for something to do. And like many many people in that in that predicament, in, in that wage where where their folks have lots of money, she was able to actually not she was able to not have to go to work right away, mm -hmm. and it was in a time period when that worked as well. And the real woman's name is Piper Kerman. Kerman, that's K E R M A N. Now, isn't there also a character named Piper in that show? Yes, the, Piper Chapman is the character in the show. And well, the main character, I guess. And she's the main character. Yeah, that's. Okay. Uh, they just didn't want to use her actual name because right. they had to change some things in the in the in the series to so they didn't upset a lot of people that were actually that she wrote about. Right. Uh, and I'm sure that she changed some of the things about them in the book as well. Well, I guess this is, um, and uh, not long ago, Pam, I'm not sure how much you've been able to follow, but we not long ago had an interview with another podcaster about a British comedy. Yes. Okay. And, um, I'm here. Okay. So <laughs> what I was going to say about that, and uh, this will draw us towards our end, is that... Uh, you know, you were saying, Sue, that the storyline of the TV series is continuing on past the, uh, the you know, the yeah. the yes. book. I, and I think that that it does go quite a ways beyond where it does in the book. Right, and I think that's you know just another example of of how American television is. You know, we want the story to keep going, even though. <laughs> this wasn't the original intention, and um, you know, there's a fair share of things that have been like that. And this is probably going to be a poor example, but um, Pam, how much '80s television do you remember? In a, a fair amount. That was my formative years for being a geek. I mean, the, mm -hmm. but now about anything that did not involve. A spaceship. I may not have that great a memory. So. <laughs> well, uh, well, I was gonna say I don't know if you're much of a fan of John Candy. Oh yeah, I, oh yeah, I know the, the big fellow from. Uh, of course, the first thing that occurs to me is so. like Second City TV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I yeah. was just going no, to say. Yeah, he, he played. He played this character in baseball. <laughs> right. So um, you know, yeah, know exactly con who he is. continuing on from. That example that Orange is the New Black is carrying the story on beyond the original book, American television has done some pretty, shall I say, remarkable things with yes. stories. Like uh, 
we'll make a TV show from anything we think will get people to watch. <laughs> and uh, in the 80s, there were some pretty bad examples of that. Like there was a John Candy film, which I thought was pretty wonderful, called Uncle Buck. And oh, I've actually seen that. You have, okay. Yes, and, and that's, um, that's, it is funny. And, you know, <laughs> I, I, um, I feel I relate with that character because I am an uncle, and uh -huh. I'm not always included in the family because I lived away for a number of years. But the most terrible thing was that they decided, let's make a TV show from this movie. So how do you continue a storyline when at the end of the movie the parents came back and the uncle got to go back to his life maybe a little bit better because now his nieces and nephews relate more with him and he has a relationship with them but now when we decide to make a TV show how do you make it so the uncle gets to say well that's easy we kill the parents in a car accident on their way home and the movie wasn't the real ending yeah I yeah I don't know I, I don't think Orange is the New Black does that exactly one of the things my understanding was that they wanted to they wanted to sh teach people or show people more about the lives and and, and the people who were in prison Mm -hmm. especially women in prison are frequently there not because they really were criminals for instance Piper did a favor for this woman she thought she was in love with right and she wasn't really involved in this drug trade she did it once possibly twice I, I, I'm not there was something in in the show that made me think that maybe that, that she had carried money twice but I'm not entirely certain I'd have to go back and look at that again but but she didn't she wasn't like a hardened criminal and yet she ended up going to jail yeah and it's prison. It, prison and jail are different things right and they point that out in the series as well but they also do backstories on most of the other major characters in the prison both the the guards and the staff there as well as the prisoners which is really interesting because you end up seeing how some of the people who are real jerks mm -hmm. that work there ended up being real jerks that were there oh. <laughs> that ended up in the prison service yeah. and you also see the the sad backstories of, of many of the people who who end up in jail and women are just notorious for helping a boyfriend yeah. uh, doing something for some other person I, it's just they they end up there not as being the prime criminal but as an accessory mm -hmm. to some to someone they love yeah I was gonna say on the and note it, of it um, really unfair frequently no on the on the note oh, of, uh, as I say, on the note of uh, the backstory of the the people who work in the prison system, you know, and learning what kind of people those are, you know, I'm sure that there are good-hearted people that work the, in there just as much yes. as there are people who are just, you know, dregs of society. Um, yeah. I, I know that my eldest sister Ronnie's best friend has been involved with somebody in a. Uh, law capacity twice. The first gentleman she was married to happened to be a corrections officer, and he had an unhealthy obsession with weaponry. And it was a few <laughs> years before she decided that maybe she shouldn't be spending the rest of her life with him. <laughs> yeah, but in that sense, it is it is more than just it is more than just an American television show. I, mm -hmm. I Netflix were was. Well, HBO probably was the first network that actually did a lot of of really good uh, series and and things of that nature. But but Netflix also picked up that that line and just their first well the first thing they came out with which was a gangster story in Edinburgh or not no it wasn't in Edinburgh I take that back it was in Norway I think. And I don't remember the name of the city, but any anyway, and that I just was not at all. It, it was really slow, and and I just 
didn't get it. Well, I, it, it just wasn't. It, it just was not. I didn't think it was well made. Mm -hmm. But the next thing that Netflix put out, which was the state of, I want to say the state of play, but that's not the right name, um, was Spacey. Uh, oh, you mean House of Cards? House of Cards, yes. Uh, which was based on a, a British show of the same. It was a British mini series, actually, mm -hmm. uh, by the same name, uh, different people and different. Uh, situations and both of them were very good um, but but House of Cards was thought to be really an extraordinary series when it was put out mm -hmm. now I have not watched it for a couple of years because I got really confused when I went to watch to, when I went to watch like third year right and so I needed I, I as I did with Orange is the New Black I needed to go back and watch the whole thing. And for our last item, we have talked about town, where we discuss listener feedback and podcast interaction. Okay. Well, Sue, I'm often a guest on a, another Pride 48 show called Poke It With a Stick, and this is a, ho a show hosted by Gavin. This show is normally on Saturday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern. I was recently a guest on there, and I met George from George in Atlanta. It was also the uh, annual Pride 48 streaming weekend. Every year, I believe it's on Father's Day weekend, in addition to an annual convention, or possibly semi-annual now, that Pride 48 has in Las Vegas, Pride48.com. Our parent network hosts a, a weekend event of streaming episodes. So just in the same way that you might listen to a radio show, many Pride 48 programs have a live show. You can go to pride48.com and there's a schedule there. Uh, by which they broadcast different programs. Of course, George was very kind, and he said that he looked forward to seeing us do our own show one day, and I mm -hmm. I uh, thanked him, and I said that, um, you know, at this moment, we're not ready, and it would be a little bit like the man behind the curtain, only <laughs> it would be the autopsy. Uh, <laughs> but, that would uh, be terrible, yeah. We, but, we aren't quite ready for that. No, not, uh, um, as they say on Saturday Night Live, not quite ready for prime time. Uh, that's, yeah. But um, perhaps next year or so. Out in the far world. And that's all the time we have for this episode. We hope you'll join us next time when we bring the far away nearby. Thank you for listening to The Far Away Nearby. You can visit our webpage at tfnpodcast.com. Find our fan page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TFNDJ. Our show is available on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Send us an email at tfnpodcast at gmail.com or call and leave a message at 720-230-6919. This show is part of the Pride 48 Network. Find more shows over at pride48.com.